besides the usual welcoming and good morning and hope people are are being safe and healthy and looking forward to spring and hopefully optimism about our world and our lives. Um, thanks for all being here. So let me um, let me announce, um, I'm actually, I'm gonna announce four upcoming uh, grand, uh, grand round events, um, which will bring us to the end of this academic year through the end of June. So on May 20th, we have Dazon Dixon Diallo and be talking on innovative justice in the HIV response, shifting power and sharing strength to end the epidemic. Um, June 3rd, we have a panel to be moderated by Ezra, Khan, Ezra Kang from Columbia. And um, this will be a panel of um, four people who are adults living with perinatal acquired HIV. So it's called Stigma from the Ground Up experiences from adults living with perinatal acquired HIV. A conversation with Danielle, Rodney, Victor, and Ezer. On June 10th, we have another panel. We'll be commemorating the 40th anniversary of the um, June 15th, 1981 MMWR report, first report on the early AIDS cases. And this panel will be moderated by our very own Ron Baer. And uh, participating in the panel will be Jesse Milan, Rafael Sader, Dana Diamond, and Anka Earhart. And then our final rounds of this academic calendar year will be on June 24th, um, going out with a, a bang. I, well, I think all of these are really wonderful events and very special in their own right. Um, and so we have Rafi Rafael Landovitz from UCLA. Uh, many of you may know he was the lead investigator on the long acting CAB uh, HPTN study, a great successful study. And he'll be talking with us about injectable prep, uh, current knowledge and outstanding questions. So please mark all those four dates in your calendar. Um, so for today, we had two people scheduled. Unfortunately, at the very last minute, there was an urgent um, emergency situation for our first, our scheduled first speaker, Will Beckham. And so unfortunately, he will not be with us today. Um, so for those of you who were expecting him, um, we didn't have time to get an announcement out. This happened at the last minute. Um, but we do have Christine Real speaking with us today. And um, so we'll, we'll give, she has more time than she would have planned. So she doesn't have to rush. However, it, it, it may be that our grand rounds today does not go to 11 o'clock. Um, we, we can go as long as we want, um, but we'll be filling the time with just one speaker, not two speakers. So let me just uh, introduce Christine. And Christine Rael, Dr. Rael is an assistant professor of clinical medical psychology and psychiatry here at Columbia and at the HIV Center. Um, she's also currently a Columbia Gray University, Columbia University Gray Matters Fellow, which is quite a prestigious award that re she received this past year. She received her PhD in Health and Behavioral Science from the University of Colorado in Denver. Dr. Rael's re research focuses on existing and emerging biomedical HIV prevention methods. She's particularly interested in developing strategies to tailor these tools to fit the unique life context of end users during the product development process, especially for transgender women. And to do this, Dr. Rail's work engages M Health strategies, such as smartphone applications, novel modes of medication delivery, and end user designed adherence support intervention. Dr. Rail's other work focuses on self and sexual partner testing, for HIV infection. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Christine. Thank you so much for doing this with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. And hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen so everyone can see my slides. Is everyone able to see that? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about uh, a process that's in development right now for tailoring uh, biomedical HIV prevention strategies to transgender women. 
Um, so a quick agenda. I'll give some background. I think a lot of people in this audience already are going to know, you know, some of the things that I'll talk about, but I'm going to give a little bit of background about transgender women and HIV in the context of New York City to kind of put this in perspective. Uh, then I'll talk about some preliminary results of my study. It's currently ongoing right now, so we, unfortunately we don't have trials results to present, um, but I'll talk about the, the results from the qualitative lead up that we have. Um, and then I'll talk about next steps and implications and what this means and how we go forward from here. So just some housekeeping things. So today's presentation is gonna focus exclusively on transgender women. So the population I'm talking about are women or gender non-conforming forming feminine spectrum folks who are assigned male at birth. So that's who I'm gonna focus on exclusively today. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about the 90-90-90 goal. So we can you know, kind of contextualize how the uh, transgender women interface with that and why we're focusing on this population. So in the first 90, uh, we know that that means that we want in the year 2020, I know it's 2021 now, but um, these are the most recent data I had found available. Uh, in the year 2020, we wanted to have 90% of people who are living with HIV to be diagnosed and to know um, about their diagnosis. And so in the United States, uh, about 86% of folks who are living with HIV meet that threshold. And in New York City, we're doing much better, 93% of people. And I should say, New York City um, outperforms uh, the United States in all of these categories. And it's one of the only cities uh, worldwide that's exceeded the 90-90-90 goals. Uh, but in the second 90, that means that we want to have 90% of folks who are diagnosed with HIV to be engaged in care in the U.S., it's 74% uh, overall, and in New York, it's 94%, uh, or I'm sorry, 90%. Part of this is hiding my slide for me. I'm going to, can I move that? Yes, I can. Okay, there we go. Um, and then the last 90, we want of those folks who are engaged in treatment to have virally, to be virally suppressed in the United States in general, 83% of people meet that mark. And in New York, 92% of people do. Oh, what did I just do? Okay, there we go. So the situation with transgender women is a little bit different. We don't have good national data on this population. Um, New York, we have some estimates about how transgender women interface with the 90-90-90 goals. And we know that here, 90% of transgender women who are living with HIV have been diagnosed. 84% of those folks are engaged in treatment and 70% of those transgender women who are engaged in treatment have uh, suppressed viral loads. So uh, that's pretty good overall. Um, but you have to keep in mind that this is a population that is living in one of the only cities in the world, if not the only city in the world, that's outperforming the 90-90-90 goal. So we know that these folks should be doing better on average. Nationally, one in seven transgender women overall are living with HIV. That's roughly 15%. And as we start to look in communities of color, we see that 26% of Latina trans women and 44% of Black trans women are living with HIV. Those are absolutely staggering numbers. And that's really why we chose to focus on this population, um, particularly because oral prep has done very you know, has had very little impact on uh, HIV incidence in this population and transgender women. Uptake of PrEP in this community is really unknown. We don't have any great estimates of this. And some of the work that I did as a sub-study of Project Affirm, we found that of the 28 people that we interviewed, uh, only 22% of them had ever used PrEP for any length of time at all in their lives. That's really low and it really highlights the importance of this type of work. We have a pill that prevents HIV and only 22% of people who are in the, the demographic that's arguably uh, shoulders the, the biggest uh, proportion uh, or the, you know, has the biggest HIV disparity, only 22% of folks in that population are taking it. So 
the the angle that we work from in this type of work is to plan for the behavioral challenges that people who are going to be using these biomedical HIV prevention products are going to have because all biomedical products at their core are inherently behavioral. You know, even if you're using a long acting product, it's some that doesn't require daily maintenance. At some point in time, it's going to require you to do something to continue using it. Um, and on top of that, these products have to be something that people want to use, that people can use, and that people feel are life additive if we're going to ask them to continue to use them on a sustained basis. And so that's really what this project and this work is aimed at doing. So the reason that I'm talking about injectable prep uh, rather than other products that are in the pipeline for you know, long acting products um, is that this is really the most promising one at this point in time. Last, um, I'm sorry, I got to take a drink of water. Last spring, it cleared stage three of clinical trials. And on top of that, there's other promising attributes to this particular strategy. Uh, one is it has, it appears to have a more favorable side effect profile for users. And the second one is that it actually outperformed uh, the oral TDF FTC, that's the oral prep pill, it outperformed that arm. People who were taking injectable cabotegravir actually had a 66% reduction in incidence of new HIV infections. So it appears to be more effective than the existing product as well. So on top of that, uh, what this actually is, is um, it's three milliliters of the drug cabotegravir. It is an intermuscular injection. It goes into the upper quadrant of the gluteal muscle. So here or the other side, it doesn't matter which side. Um, and it lasts for eight weeks. Three, the reason it goes into the gluteal muscle rather than other sites on the body is because it's a pretty large injection. Three milliliters when it's in the syringe is roughly the size of a AA battery. So it has to go into a very large muscle and, and the gluteus is, is where it's currently approved. Or not approved, I shouldn't say approved, uh, where it was, it was tested. So the work that I'm gonna talk about today was informed by a pilot study, thank you HIV Center Development Corps, um, was informed by a pilot study that really aimed to understand the barriers and facilitators that transgender women had in using and uh, using in a sustained way uh, long, emerging and existing HIV prevention products. So we particularly focused on long acting cabotegravir here. And we also wanted to ask people about their smartphone ownership in this study because we were considering developing a smartphone app to facilitate adherence to this, this long acting product in a future study. So we wanted to know what people's cell phone use and ownership looked like. And so we did interviews, in-depth interviews with 28 people. Uh, then we did on these topics, and then we did focus groups with 18 people. We did four focus groups, uh, three were in English, one was in Spanish, and we ended up getting a number of publications from this. Uh, and one of the really interesting things that came out of this is we learned that uh, smartphone ownership in the 28 people that participated was ubiquitous. Every single person owned a smartphone. Every single person reported having consistent access to internet. Um, and everyone reported uh, frequently using apps. And this was across multiple socioeconomic statuses. We had people that reported incomes as low as $300 per month in New York City, all the way up to much, much more than that. And all of these people reported consistent uh, smartphone ownership and use. But the thing that really came out of this, the big overarching finding of all of this is that current HIV prevention services and methods, and even those in the pipeline were perceived is not effectively engaging with transgender women. And when we asked folks about uh, the cabotegravir injection specifically and how we should be delivering this, people really said things like, you know, in, I, I should present more kind of the general theme structuring this. People in our groups and in our interviews talked a lot about developing products 
that are built on the needs uh, or built on the things that transgender women are already doing well in the community. To build these um, you know, delivery methods around things that people are already doing and strengths in the community. And so, you know, one of those things or one of those strengths was our participants talked about self-injecting hormones. And so they were kind of like, you know, I can already self-inject. Why do I have to go to a doctor's office for you to inject me with PrEP when this is something I already do? And people also talked about, uh, you know, getting their hormone injections delivered in drop-in clinics in the city. And, you know, that worked as clinics that were open during certain hours of the day where you could bring in your hormone prescription and a provider would inject you and then you could leave and you didn't need an appointment. You didn't have to do other activities. You didn't have insurance. You didn't have to pay. It was just in, out, done with your injection. And people really asked us why we couldn't do this with injectable prep too. So that was what we decided to focus on and what we're now calling the R-SHOT study. So we wanted to, as a part of this study, develop a nurse-led in intervention to deliver injectable PrEP in exactly the way people suggested that we do in these pilot studies. So we're focusing on self-injection, where we mail people all of their injection materials in advance of their injection, including all of the stuff that they, they need to support the injection, like gloves, um, alcohol swabs, band-aids, all that kind of good stuff, and the injection. Uh, and then also injection at drop-in centers where people come to our clinic at appointed hours. Um, they don't need an appointment. They just walk in, a nurse injects them and they leave. And then we also wanted to design uh, because of this high uh, smartphone ownership and you know, support for using apps, we wanted to develop an M Health component to help people manage their participation in the study and manage their timely injections and particularly to support folks when they were self-injecting at home. And we wanted to tailor these strategies. So the self-injection, injection and drop-in centers and the um, M Health app, we wanted to compare that to the current trial strategy. So we are, uh, you know, having, you know, self-injection and injection at drop-in centers as well as a smartphone app that is our intervention group. And I'll talk specifically more about how we did that uh, further on in the presentation, but we wanted to compare that to a control group that's engaging a very similar process to what's happening in HPTN 083, which is our control. So the first thing that we did is we did uh, in-depth interviews with 15 transgender women to understand their preferences around the M Health app that we were de uh, developing. And we also really wanted to know what folks wanted to see out of the trials environment. We know that, because uh, another thing that we heard in our pilot study is that a lot of these products really feel like they are developed for gay and bisexual men, developed with gay and bisexual men in mind, um, and that the trials were really for bi gay and bisexual men, which made people quite hesitant to join and to get engaged with this type of work. And so we wanted to know from people, what does it look like if a trial puts you at the center? How do we make these types of HIV prevention trials really uniquely streamlined to the needs of transgender participants? So we did interviews to understand that. And then we did design sessions, which were really focus groups. But what we did was we um, created mock app screens. The, the purpose was to develop the app further. And we took mock app screens that we developed using data from the in-depth interviews and showed them to participants in these design sessions to get feedback on the content features and functionality uh, of, of the app. So this is what it looked like. These are the, uh, these are the mock screens that we had. Um, we built them in a program called Fluid UI. We showed them to participants in these design sessions over PowerPoint. And then we asked them you know, questions using a structured questionnaire about how to uh, streamline these app screens to the needs of the population, what information we needed to present, how people wanted to navigate through it, what other features they wanted the app to have, et cetera. 
And so that's finished as well. So what we know so far is we know transgender women's preferences on, preferences on the beta version of our app. So that app right now um, is out with the population and the intervention group. So it's in trials right now, but we can talk about what people said they wanted to see in that app. And we also know what uh, this population's preferences were and how they wanted a clinical trial to look for them. And we found that this really just translates to clinical care in general, in the clinical environment in general. There's a lot of parallels in translation there for that. So I will, so this is what the beta version of the app looks like. I will play this for you. Um, it's just a brief navigation through it. Renato um, designed this for us. It was, um, I think he did a beautiful job, but so I'll, I'll let this navigation play. So you log in, there's the home screen. You can scroll down uh, and click on any of the tabs. So we had step-by-step -step content uh, about how to do the injection and how to do you know, other activities around it, like filling a syringe. And then people also wanted video. So we have a quick video on how to do that. This was shot by our nurse. So start by setting everything up with an alcohol pad, a syringe, a needle, and a vial of saline. Before you get started, open the packages to the syringe and to the needle. You don't need to take anything out. This will just make it easier to connect things later on. And then, you know, you can navigate back to the screen. People wanted to know who was on the other side of uh, any messaging that happened over the app. It's the nurse. So we had a special page devoted to her and her availability. I guess a special tab. And then another thing that people wanted was they wanted to be able to monitor their progress in the study. So we have a feature where, you know, it lays out specifically what you're going to do in each study visit at each point in the visit or in the study so that people can prepare for that. So that's what the app looks like right now. It's just a, you know, a kind of brief demo. Um, so something that we hear pretty consistently across all, all uh, I think, HIV prevention work is how important reminders are. People really talked about wanting uh, a feature to let them know in advance when their injection is due so that they can plan for it. Like I said, the injections are every eight weeks, which is great because the product lasts for a long time. On the other hand, it gives you more time to forget when it's due. And so that was something that people really wanted. Uh, another thing was, you know, as you saw in the app demo, was to have access to a nurse. Um, and so this was particularly important for the self-injection group. People really wanted to know that there was somebody that they could contact and reach to ask questions if they were having any sort of difficulty or trouble at home. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there were appointed hours during the day where they could reach out to and contact the nurse using um, video chat uh, or text message and the nurse would respond to them. Uh, also the nurse, uh, if you message her, you know, during off hours, when she's back on her on hours again, has, uh, you know, she's tasked with responding to that query immediately. So people aren't left hanging. Um, again, more step-by-step -step instructions people wanted. Uh, they wanted videos of everything. And this was, again, very important to the step-by-step -step group. People wanted to be able to watch somebody doing the skills that they were going to be asked to do. And they also wanted to be able to see it written out with pictures, what they were being asked to do. Um, and so that was another thing that we really included in the beta version of the app. So preferences that people talked about in our groups about making the clinical trials environment really friendly to transgender women is people really wanted to see visuals that were welcoming and celebratory of transgender identity. So people talked about things like 
seeing the flag, seeing images of transgender women in the clinic, seeing, you know, buttons and stickers that say things like everyone is welcome here, um, buttons with pronouns, things like that really helped to create an atmosphere of inclusion and acceptance and made people feel like they could anticipate respect, which is not something that happens in every clinical encounter for this population. Another thing that was quite important for people is that they wanted study activities to happen in a safe space, meaning a space that's known for serving LGBT individuals, particularly transgender women. People weren't picky about what this space was they said, you know, it could be a clinic, uh, a clinic, it could be a community center, it could be, you know, anything, just as long as it's something that has a reputation for being mindful of the needs of transgender women and serving this population effectively. Another thing that really came up over and over again is people wanted the incentives for participation to be mindful of the needs of the community. And, you know, what ended up happening in these interviews is people talked a lot about things like food insecurity. Um, and that's well documented in this population. And, you know, people said things like, in addition to paying for my time and transport, it's not easy out there to eat. It's not easy out there at all. And so um, giving people a little snack to either leave with, or, you know, it's not always possible if you're doing clinical activities, but if it's like an interview-based study to consume while they're on site um, is really shows that you get it, that you understand what the community is going through, that, you know, you have food and water and things like that on site. Um, and, and it was just, seen and suggested as being a really nice gesture in addition to traditional incentives. So one thing that we're doing in the clinical trial piece of this is we have a like a, a snack pack that we that we prepare for everybody um, that they take when they leave, they get, you know, all their study, uh, you know, we give them a, a sticker, their cash, and then a snack bag. Um, Another thing that people talk quite a bit about is those things that you learn in, uh, you know, gender inclusivity trainings it turn out to be extremely important. So making sure that everyone on staff in the clinic, from the person that they see when they walk in to the providers and everybody up, down and in between is trained on correct use of pronouns, is trained on, you know, uh, preferred name versus maybe the name that's on the medical record and making sure that we're really engaging practices to ensure that um, the, encounter, the entire encounter in clinic is gender affirming and respectful to folks. And related to that is making sure that everybody is able to meet people where they're at. And this doesn't just mean in terms of transition, it's more broad than that. Also in life, you know, a major theme in our interview was just how difficult a road it is to walk for many, many transgender women and being mindful of where people are on that road and just meeting them there and not, you know, um, you know, just being very aware that, you know, this is, this is where people are today. Um, and this is, you know, what I, I need to make sure that I, as the person who's delivering um, these study materials are, you know, I'm mindful of and respectful of. So um, the in-depth interviews and the design sessions are finished. Um, so the next phase was the partially randomized patient preference trial. And so I'll talk about a little bit of what that design looks like in the next slide. This piece right here that I just talked about was the qualitative lead up. Right now we are in the trials phase. Um, so what we did or what we're in the process of doing is recruiting 45 transgender women. We want them to be sexually active. They cannot have hip thigh or gluteal implants. The reason for this is because um, those implants or injections interfere with the delivery of the long acting cab in the um, gluteal muscle. And they also must be willing to inject saline. So in this 
particular uh, project, we are using a placebo substance. And the reason for that is because we wanted to separate people's experience with the delivery method from their experience with the drug. Um, and because we, we, you know, we wanted to know what, what it was like to self-inject or in like to, you know, come in for drop-in visits unrelated to the experience you might be having with the drug. Um, so we use two to one randomization uh, where two people are going into the intervention group for every one person that goes into the control group. And if you're randomized to the intervention group, you can choose which injection strategy you want to, you want to do. You can choose to do self-injection or you can choose to do drop-in injection. And the reason behind this was we really wanted to know what people's preferences were. Um, you know, if people you know, if they can do and want to do the things that they said that they wanted to do in these um, interviews. So you choose which group you go into, you can switch groups halfway through. You know, if you decide that you're in over your head with self-injection, you can switch to the drop-in group and vice versa. If you decide you want to try self-injection um, partway through and you're in the, the drop-in group, you can do that as well. Um, because to us, we, we found that that was data. We thought that that was data. You know, if people think they want to do self-injection and can't, uh, that's meaningful. And we wanted to know that. And then we enrolled 15 people into the control group and they engage the protocol that's currently used for HBTN 083. So what the uh, partially randomized patients preference trial uh, uh, procedures look like for the two injection groups is in the self-injection group at your first visit, the enrollment visit, you did a rapid HIV test and you got a training on how to self-inject. So the nurse, um, the clinical research nurse would work with you to show you how to self-inject and you would actually self-inject your own injection before you leave. Uh, and she, she won't let you uh, continue to self-inject unless she's comfortable with your ability to do it in clinic. So if you can't do it, she won't let you out the door um, with the injection materials. Instead, she would discuss potentially enrolling in the drop-in group and then you can further uh, try to refine those self-injection skills in, in future visits. Uh, you also do an interview on injection choice, you know, which group on why you chose the group that you did. And lastly, you get an orientation with how to use the app. In the uh, next two visits, in months two and months four, you're not required to go to the site at all. Instead, what happens is we mail you a rapid HIV test and all of the materials for self-injection, including the injection it itself in an unmarked box that comes to the address of your choice. And you just do the injection at home. You get reminders through the app telling you, you know, to do the injection. And then you respond to us over the app whether or not you've done it. And then lastly, in uh, the um, exit visit, you, will do a rapid HIV test in the office. And we would see you for that, for the uh, self-injection group. You do a rapid HIV test in the office. You would do a, your last self-injection in front of the nurse. Our rationale behind that is that, you know, if you can't do it in front of the nurse in office, it's unlikely that you've been doing it at home, regardless of what you've been reporting to us. And then you'll do an interview uh, on your experience with the self-injection at home and the app. And an important thing to, to know is that in this study, we did not tie compensation to completed injections. Um, you know, we're, we're not so concerned about whether or not you do the injection. What we're concerned with is whether or not you could or felt comfortable with it. So if you can't do it, we want to know that and we want to understand why. Um, so the, the compensation is tied to the reporting. So if you, you know, um, text us whether or not you did it, regardless of what that response is, and you show up to your exit visit, you're going to get compensated, regardless of whether or not you did the injection. Um, so in the drop-in injection group, what happens is in month one, you know, your or visit one, your, your visit looks very similar to the self-injection group. You know, you're going to get your rapid HIV test. You're going to do your interview on injection choice, and then you're going to get oriented with our app uh, and the nurse will do your first injection. That's the one difference. 
in months two and three, you'll come to, you'll get a reminder on the app on um, when your injection is due, you'll come to the clinic without an appointment. You don't have to call in advance. You don't have to do anything. You just have to show up during our drop-in hours. And our drop-in hours are staggered uh, between late morning, early afternoon, and late afternoon in two-hour windows um, on different days of the week. So for example, on Monday, there might be a two-hour window in late morning. On Tuesday, there might be a two-hour window in early afternoon, and so on. And so you just come in during those hours. You get your injection, no appointment, no nothing. Uh, you're just in, out, done. They're designed to take less than uh, 10 minutes. And then your exit visit is very similar to, or visit for your exit visit is very similar to the visit, uh, the exit visit for all other groups where you're gonna do an HIV test, you're gonna get your last injection, again, delivered by a nurse in this case, and you're gonna do an interview on your experience with the app and your experience with the injection method that you chose. So uh, the analysis. The way that that will work in the study is we'll um, use our interviews with participants to refine the study adherence interventions, particularly the M Health app um, and the clinical trials environment for uh, use in future studies. And we also want to know about people's experiences with the delivery method so that we can refine that for use in future studies as well. Um, and then we're also going to discuss what it was like using the app with the nurse. So we'll have this conversation with the nurse as well to make sure that it's clinically feasible and it's something that a nurse could do in a future study. And not only that, but it's possible that staff nurse or staff RNs could run this app in a regular clinic setting so that we can refine it for that. Um, and then we would tabulate adherence for each delivery method. So uh, in this study, uh, three out of four injections is considered high adherence. So the groups that have high adherence would be those groups that we would consider moving forward with in future studies. So um, we know that it's going to be impossible to engage any of these injection delivery strategies without the buy-in of the providers uh, who will be either prescribing PrEP medications or long-acting capitagravir medications or uh, having those counseling conversations presenting these options of long-acting capitagravir and potentially training people on self-injection, running these you know, drop-in self-injection clinics, et cetera. So right now, a big part of what we're doing is we're doing interviews with these folks to understand their knowledge and perceptions of injectable prep more generally, but then to understand their perceptions of and perceived feasibility of the tailored strategies to inject prep, as well as their willingness to prescribe this and their willingness to uh, recommend and um, facilitate these tailored strategies to their transgender patients. And then lastly, we wanna understand uh, provider perspectives. And I should mention too, that we're asking these same questions about communication to our transgender patients or transgender participants, but we wanna know about how trans participants and providers want to have a conversation about PrEP and how they want that to be brought up, how they want to you know, discuss it and what tools they might need to make that conversation more productive so that everybody leaves feeling like you know, they have the right information, they've made the right choice. Um, and it's something that, you know, can, can be ongoing. Uh, sustained use of this medication is possible. So we wanted to learn that as well. So in summary, what we know from, or what we will know from these projects is, you know, right now we know that existing PrEP methods don't fit for transgender women, but we have a plan to change it for future strategies. Um, these Taller strategies, like I mentioned before, the ones with high adherence are ones we want to test in future studies to see with active drug um, and with a much larger participant population, if this actually makes a difference for people's uptake and sustained use of long-acting injectable PrEP. Um, 
and we'll also have an idea of what's feasible for nurses, the people who are going to be, you know, working on these types of studies, the people who are going to be interfacing with clients the most, uh, and potentially the people who are going to be working with this app. And because we're having this conversation with the nurse that's going to be uh, using the study app, we'll have an idea of not only, you know, what's feasible from a, an anticipated point of view, um, which is what we'll get from the interviews that we're doing that I mentioned a second ago, but we'll also know what's actually feasible from a practice perspective from the person who's already done this. And we'll have a transgender developed M health adherence tool. So this um, app, like I mentioned before, was developed by transgender women in these groups. I mean, they made all of the decisions down to the font, the background, how you navigate through the app, the images that we present, these were all handpicked by transgender women in our groups and in our interviews. We were just kind of the scientific conduit to put it into an app form. Um, and we'll continue to refine it based on these preferences. So we'll have this tool that was made by the community for the community that we can continue using. And then lastly, we'll have an idea of what's feasible for prescribers. We'll know, um, you know, what trainings people need to get more comfortable with injectable cabotegravir. We'll know how they want these trainings presented and we'll know what needs they have. And if they're willing to do uh, these streamlined strategies or tailored strategies for transgender women. So we'll have an idea about how to deliver that content as well. So, so that was, that's it, that's the end. So um, I have a lot of thank yous to make here, Alex, who is on this call, my, my wonderful mentor, um, uh, has, has really helped me throughout this process, as well as my co-mentor, Walter Bakting, has been a huge help in this, um, as well as the other mentors mentioned on this list. Uh, and this is not possible without the wonderful research team I work with. Oh, gosh. Dr. Javier Lopez Rios, that was an oversight. He just earned his PhD last week. Um, so he is an MPH PhD now, uh, Michelle Martinez, Caitlin McCray, Jonathan Porter, Doyle Doss, Michael Vaughn, uh, Elena Abascal, who's our uh, clinical research nurse on this project, as well as our very own Curtis Dolezal. So, and a big thank you to all of the research participants who have been a part of this work as well. Thank you, Christine, for just the very innovative and, and really important, important work and important um, topic and, and great presentation. Uh, to turn it over to my colleague, Stephen Sukumaran, to monitor the discussion. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Christine, we have two questions from John Cho. And John, feel free to um, unmute yourself if you'd like to expand on these. John asks, uh, what was the reason why injectables would not use the thigh? And I'm also- sorry, I missed the last injectables would not, oh, use the thigh, okay. And sure. what was the discussion around preloaded injectables? So the reason that injectables don't use the thigh, we hope that they will use the thigh in the future. Um, it was tested in the gluteal muscle. The injection is so big uh, that my understanding is HBT and OA3 wanted to put the injection into the biggest muscle in the body. Um, but the thigh is an dis is, is ongoing discussion and that, that is probably the next frontier for this. Um, and the preloaded syringe, so we ended up, I don't know if I, if I put that in the slide, that might've been an oversight. So we did not end up using a preloaded safety syringe. We ended up using a safety syringe with a vial of saline separate we wanted the injection to mimic injectable cab in every single way possible. So the syringe gauge was the same, the injection volume was the same, it went into the same site in the body. Um, what ended up happening, or you know, we ended up learning during HPTN 3 is that cab crystallizes in the syringe after two hours. So you can't, you know, you can't mail a preloaded syringe of cabotegravir. So we wanted to make sure um, that we weren't doing this for this project as well. Thanks, Christine. Um, a question from Alex. Given that the study is still underway, is it possible to include a few questions that may allow inferences on how transgender women are availing themselves of COVID vaccines? Uh, they may be experiencing similar bar barriers to those you're currently observing in their use of PrEP. Yes, and that's a great idea. 
Yeah, we're about to do um, phone interviews with uh, our intervention participants right now where we ask them because there are several people are starting to come up on their third injection where we ask them about their experience with the app so we can collect some preliminary data on their you know, experience with the app while it's still in the field. And this could potentially be a good place to ask them about COVID vaccine access. Um, John is asking generally about storage. John, feel free to unmute yourself and expand upon that. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, like, um, does it have to be kept in the refrigerator? Uh, you know, something that you can keep in your in your closet? Because I know some people don't want other. Like, if you live in a household where you may not want other people knowing you're taking prep. So how would you know? Was that was that discussion had? Or are these all people that just you know that understand this process and only doing it because they don't mind other people knowing that they're, they're taking these injectables. And as far as the mailing process goes, if, 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 if a certain amount of doses are given like a month, why not just have the patient come in and you hand them the preloaded injectables and they take them home with them and you don't have to worry about the mailing process. Yeah, so that may be that may be something that we do in the future. I think in the future, what we would do, um, and one of the lessons learned so far from this is the mailing process doesn't work for everybody. You know, people have a variety of housing situations, and there will be a contingency of people who will want to come and pick up their medication. The reason that uh, we mailed um, the injection supplies in this particular version of the study is because. Our participants in our preliminary work really said that coming to get this is going to be a pain and a barrier to use unless the location is really convenient to my house. Um, so we wanted to make it as convenient as possible, but we've certainly learned um, that there are challenges with the mailing process. Um, we kind of anticipated that with some of the built-in processes that we have with uh, you know, our verification of, of mailing, you know, of receipt of the packages. So we have a process where you know, we track the package as soon as it arrives at the participant's door, um, the nurse will check in to make sure that the person got it. And if they say no, we'll overnight them a new package. Um, that hasn't worked 100% of the time. Um, there was one case where we we had to we had to remail the package. The person ended up getting it the second time, but you know, we don't have a 100% completion rate for the package arriving and the person getting it. Um, so yeah, no, that's very true. We need to have a pickup option in the future. That's absolutely true. Um, with respect to storage of the cab, we recommend in this study that people um, store it at room temperature. And so, and, and I believe that is what is required of CAB currently. Um, so it doesn't matter, you know, we didn't tell people, you know, hide it uh, or not. That was up to their discretion. And certainly again, um, self-injection is not gonna work for everybody. That's kind of one of the advantages of long acting cabotegravir is if you don't want to store anything at your house, you don't have to. You can come for the drop-in visits. And that's certainly a discussion that we have with folks at the enrollment visit, if is you know if you don't want to have this in your house, you don't have to. You can just come and see us every two months. No one has to know where you're going. Um, and it's in this study takes place in a clinic that is LGBT focused, but it's not an HIV clinic. So you know anybody that's there could be there for a variety of things. Thank you. I, I think you did a great job, and it was very very informative for me. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. I will tell you one thing that, um, this is just anecdotal at this point, but one thing that we were really worried about um, was buy-in from providers on the self-injection. And we are about half, well, actually we're slightly more than halfway through our provider interviews. 
And every single person that we've interviewed, and we've, we have people from, you know, all over the US right now from, you know, certainly New York and California are represented, but we have folks from Baltimore, Illinois, Missouri. Um, we have someone scheduled from Tennessee, you know, we have people from multiple states in the middle of the country in the south as well. And everybody has been exceptionally supportive of the idea of self injection which was a surprise to me, but we're only halfway through. So I may be, I don't want, I'm knocking on wood right now. I don't want to jinx any of this. That's great to hear. Uh, last call for questions. Otherwise I'll hand it back to Bob. I'm sorry, can I jump in? Sure, go ahead, John. Sorry, uh, nobody else seems to be under. How about aging? You, you haven't spoken about aging and how this affects the trans trans women that are aging with not just HIV, but possibly doing these PrEP injections? So we don't have anybody who's uh, living with HIV in this study. So we, we don't, um, you know, you know, monitor experiences people are having aging with HIV in this study. Um, and you know, I couldn't tell you right now, the average age of participant that we have enrolled right now. Um, but certainly I will say uh, another anecdotal thing is it seems like the women who are older came to this. Another thing I should mention, again, I'm knocking on wood again. Um, every person that we've enrolled into the injection group, we've enrolled or into the intervention group, we've enrolled about six right now every single person has chosen self-injection, which was another surprise to us. And it has been that anecdotally, it seems that uh, older women already know how to self-inject and are like, I already know how to do this. Can I just do this and go home? And we're like, no, please stay and answer our questions. Um, uh, the younger uh, women are the ones who've needed the training, but they were able to do it too. Um, so it does look like maybe there's a difference um, I know that a lot of uh, transgender women who are younger prefer uh, oral hormone treatment, whereas older women tend to prefer uh, injectable treatments. Um, but that's anecdotal at this point. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. We have a question from Chris. Ferreras, sorry if I missed this, providers are open to self-injection. Are they being asked about what transgender women feel like are affirming parts of being in care out of practice? And are providers or settings indicating they could commit to more of those initiatives? So we did not ask providers what they believe transgender women feel are affirming practices. We did not ask that. Um, we do ask them about their experiences delivering information about these products to transgender women and how um, how you know they feel would be productive and gender affirming on their end. Um, one thing that we really focused on in these provider interviews is we know from the other preliminary work that we did is that you know transgender women oftentimes leave those encounters either feeling confused, about the information that they've just been giving or uh, a little insulted because they feel like it's dumbed down so much. One great quote that someone had from preliminary work is she said, uh, when you are trans and you go in looking for PrEP, uh, providers think you can't understand words bigger than four letters and it's just offensive. Um, but then on the provider end, they have a ton of information that they have to give uh, that's very complex in a very short period of time. And they also have to cater to a wide audience, you know, that have varying health literacy skills. So that's a challenge too. So what we wanted to know from both ends is like, okay, you're a provider. Uh, what are the priority information points you want your patients who are transgender to know about PrEP? And then we asked transgender women, you know, what is it that you need to know about PrEP to feel comfortable taking this? What do you want the provider to tell you? And how do you want that message delivered? 
and we asked a similar question to the providers to try to come to a consensus of a gender affirming, productive, respectful conversation where the information that's useful is getting communicated across both parties. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, but no, we didn't ask the specific question that that you did. <laughs> that would have been good. Thanks, Christine. Any other questions? Uh, if not, Bob, it's all yours. Okay, thank you so much, Christine. That was really, really fantastic and really, again, innovative, important work. And thanks for everyone for joining. And just a reminder to hope to see you all in two weeks for Days on Dixon Diallo on an Innovating Justice in the HIV Response, Shifting Power and Sharing Strength to End the Epidemic. Uh, take good care, everyone. Have a good couple of weeks and hope to see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. <laughs>